Welcome everyone to our ArcView Access program. Uh, today we're doing a CEO circle where I'm joined by ArcView's incredible alliance partner, North Star Financial. I'm Jeff Finkel, CEO of the ArcView Group and uh, happy to be here today to host. Our CEO, our CEO circles are a chance to learn more about the ever-changing cannabis industry and reliable resources that make this industry a success, companies such as North Star. So this will be a one-on-one -on -one interview with North Star CEO, Lorenzo Nurafachan, to learn about his story, challenges, successes, uphill battles, because we all have them, his personal advice and lessons learned along the way. But before I begin, let me just briefly reacquaint you with the ArcView Group. The ArcView Group is an event management and financial services firm that leverages its thought leadership through programs and services to facilitate growth in the cannabis, psychedelic, and industrial hemp industries. We as a group are committed to the social mission, the regulatory evolution, as well as the economic growth of these industries, as in our view, all three are codependent. We operate four subsidiaries at the ArcView Group. ArcView Capital, our FINRA registered broker dealer, providing investment banking services and now offering a crowdfunding site. ArcView Consulting, uh, a capable team standing ready for those of you who are interested in pursuing cannabis license and for those of you seeking growth strategy services. ArcView Ventures, our principal investing group that Gene Sullivan and I run along uh, with a bunch of others our collective fund, which is sort of the first investing property, has made 17 investments, has 78 investors, and we welcome you to reach out to us if you have a company that you would like us to review. And then most recently, ArcView Event and Experiences, our joint venture with McVeigh Global Meeting and Events to relaunch and create scale for our in-person event business, manage our digital programming like you're experiencing tonight, operate our Women's Inclusion Network, which provides a platform for women in the industry to network, collaborate, and support each other's participation in these industries. This joint venture will also provide third-party event management services to operators in the industry, leveraging our brand and contacts. All right, to succeed at this, we leverage our thought leadership through a series of digital content, our town halls, where we explore the nuances of the cannabis programs on a state-by-state -state basis, and our Arc through Access series, where we explore topics that are important to the industry. CEO circles such as this, where we explore the war and peace stories of C-level executives, entrepreneurs, and we will soon be back producing live in-person events. All right, now I'd like to welcome our good friend, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, welcome to our stage. And if you wouldn't you, mind, Jeff. if you wouldn't mind, Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this industry and tell us a little bit about North Star. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and representing the firm. Um, so obviously you guys have done an amazing thing with RQ over the, the past years and supporting the community and the industry as a whole and uh, pleasure to be part of it. Uh, so North Star started off a decade ago, focusing in the tech and entertainment space and uh, about six years ago, we had uh, certain uh, friends and colleagues and clients reaching out to us about cannabis. And uh, we started looking into what's 280E and cannabis chart of accounts. And none of these really materials really existed um, from an accounting and finance and tax perspective. So uh, we started to to, well, first of all, when we found out about Tweety E, we just got extremely upset. <laughs> How could, you know, these companies that have been so, you know, working in, 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 in these traditional black markets and now trying to be, you know, buttoned up and work in, in this compliance space are now facing ridiculous tax burdens. Uh, so immediately, you know, we decided to try to come up with a method and the ability to support these companies. Um, and to date, you know, we, we've worked with hundreds uh, of companies, um, you know, close to a thousand to date and um, have helped many companies go from seed to sale um, and everything in between. And, um, you know, we're, we're proud that, you know, we've saved over $30 million in taxes just related to 280E and have a 100% success rate at penalty-free IRS audits. 
Amazing. So really kind of finding the the best balance of being as aggressive as possible and but never quite letting our clients overstep the bounds and, and get in trouble. So it's, it's a fine yeah. line. But uh, just, a, just a quick note there, although I assume most of our listeners know the 280E issue, but uh, 280E is part of the IRS tax code that essentially says if you're a cannabis operator, you cannot deduct operating expenses um, from your revenue, and therefore you're essentially paying taxes on gross profit. That's pretty onerous. So yeah. just want to kind of get that out there. Um, yeah. yeah crazy, no, that's, that's, so it, it's like if operators don't have enough stacked against them, they have yeah. to deal with 280. Yeah. I mean, it, it was hard enough, you know, for our clients to get licenses in the first place, um, find, you know, accounting for a software that'll even work with cannabis and, um, and, 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 and banking, right? It's like there's the, every, there's just so many, uh, you know, and, and everybody, it's interesting, you know, if you look, look at these state specific uh, regulations, uh, the, the states are forecasting all this revenue for cannabis. So that's where cultivation taxes come in, excise taxes, the municipalities are doing percentage of gross receipts. And, you know, it's not only a, a, a regulatory labyrinth that we need to kind of help our, our clients go through, but it's it's how to be maintaining profitability uh, in with 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 all those burden burdensome taxes. I, I want to go deeper on the tax issue, by the way, because I think that's really important and a, a critical success component for this industry to ultimately succeed. But before I do, let me just ask you maybe to go up a layer. Uh, one abstraction higher, and maybe just describe the panoply of services that North Star offers. Sure. So we give give bucket it to give our listeners a way to really understand your full scope of services and how you can help them. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we we um, you know, if, if we think about the challenge that we're coming to solve, um, I think it's probably the best way to understand why we do what we do and what we do. Um, so you know, the 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 main issues are given this. Can't you know tax regulation um, burdens that they have to face? Um, given that a lot of the systems that come in traditional markets are not present in cannabis, uh, and, and the fact that it is a newer industry, you know whether it's ten years old or a few years old, depending what state you're in, um, it finding accounting and finance professionals that actually know what they're doing and know how to navigate um, the cannabis industry and, and, and some of the challenges that it faces are, are very extremely, you know, it's rare to come by. So what we've done is essentially we operate as an extension of our client's team. Uh, we run their financial operations. So we come in as their bookkeeper, their accountant, controller, finance, FPNA and CFO, uh, as well as all, obviously all the tax uh, compliance and income tax, you know, filings uh, as needed. Um, and, you know, the, the difference where how we operate as most traditional accounting firm is, you know, it's sort of co companies traditionally have had, and they've actually wrote, written an article about this, about us. Um, so traditionally, there's two main paradigms. There's either your in-house team that you build out and you train them and they're your team and it's expensive, there's payroll costs, there's overhead, there's training, there's benefits, et cetera. And, but it's your, it's your robust in-house team. Um, you know, obviously the challenges aside from a cost perspective is if, if something happens to them, uh, you have to find another person and pay a recruiter and, uh, you know, train them again. And, you know, so it could be a bit disruptive. Um, you know, the other solution people think about is, okay, well, let's go with an outsourced solution. We'll send this to some back office um, whether it's overseas or whether it's low, domestic, but it'll be some accounting firm that'll kind of take our books, do you know, do the data entry, and send us our financials at the end of the month. So I found both of those to have too too many gaps. Like in in the accounting firm, typical accounting firm scenario, you're still struggling with you don't have your team. So if you need something done, you need to pick up the phone, you need to talk to someone. It's like, oh, sorry, we're backed up. We have these other clients. So we've, what we've tried to do is create a, the fully integrated 
financial partner model where our bookkeepers were trained on all the cannabis regulations to understand the cannabis industry inside and out um, and, and all the tax regulations um, up to our CFO become our dedicated team for our clients. So essentially, when I say we run the financial operations for our clients, what I mean is we provide a bookkeeper, a controller, a CFO to make sure that they're getting the full robust team, but at a fraction of the cost of hiring it in-house. So in one respect, they're just hard to find. Um, additionally, not only are they hard to find, but sometimes it's not feasible to have a full-time resource for each financial operational professional all the way up the stack from bookkeeper to senior controller to CFO. You might need the bookkeeper 20 hours a month. You might need the staff controller two weeks out of the month and the CFO 10, 15 hours a month. So this is a leveraged way in which to get the exact services you need at an optimized price. I think that's, that's a, you, sh you, should, you should run our sales department. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll just craft the marketing message. Yeah, um, there you go. There you go. Right, yeah, so that's, I, that's, that's essentially I get that, it. But, I mean, you know, as you, as you started to describe the services, you're sort of talking about an extension of a team. Are you providing services where you are in fact the entire financial services team and maybe there's a CEO, a COO and a chief marketing officer, but no internal financial infrastructure where you're doing it all? Um, do you do that or is it sort of your sweet spot where there's one or two or three financial services people at the firm and you're augmenting? So yeah, believe it or not, the majority of our clients, we are their entire financial team. Got it. So for the majority of our clients, it, again, it doesn't make sense for them to have a full-time CFO when 50% of that time, they're gonna need to act as a controller. It's just not cost-effective. So there's been times where we've come in, so one, you know, one of our largest you know, up cultivators uh, in California, they had a controller, three bookkeepers, a payroll specialist, um, they did not have a CFO and they kind of brought us in to fill the gaps because they wanted to get audited. And, um, you know, they're making, uh, you know, 30 million in revenues. Um, <clears throat> this is already two years ago. And um, they, uh, so, so we kind of came in to fill in the gaps, identify process improvements. And then it was just very clear within a couple months that we really brought all the everything to the table and um, their, their controller, um, you know, was, was kind of on her way out anyway. And we, we ended up replacing their team, their in-house team, um, because, you know, frankly, again, because none of these costs are, are deduct, your finance team is non-deductible. So finding a, a very efficient uh, way of, providing that service at, you know, at a fraction of the cost is obviously a very valuable need, you know, whether, whether or not, what was interesting is we actually ended up hiring some of those bookkeepers because they're actually good bookkeepers. Hired them so back. We actually hired them and, uh, and, and they're working on, on different uh, of our clients now. So it, it um, you know, kind of is, the cannabis industry is interesting in that way where it, it is a lot of fam family dynamics where it's, you know, there's a lot of shared resources and personalities. Understood. I've been a fan of fractional CFO services and in my investing career have recommended and used them in companies I've been involved in. I mean, you're right. It's an efficient use of resource. I tell you, even in one company long past their series B raise, uh, against my better judgment, we used a fractional CFO service long before, long after we probably should have hired a full-timer. But it worked out and that company eventually exited and honestly, uh, everything was well done. Um, so in addition to just sort of taking over as an adjunct or a complete sort of financial operations role in a company, what else, what other services do you extend to do? Do you help um, on due diligence for acquisitions? Do you help arrange financing? Um, do you... Um, provide any other sort of related services for your clients? Yeah, do you do no, tax no. returns? Yeah. So yeah, tax returns are an easy one. Absolutely. But, but let me, let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt myself, actually. Let me just ask a question about tax returns. So if you're the financial operations group, 
and you're also doing the tax return, are you also doing review functions and audit functions? Wouldn't that be sort of a conflict of interest? Yes. Or you, sort so, of, you don't do that, but you will actually process the tax return. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do the tax returns, uh, local, state, federal, income and non-income tax returns, uh, you know, hundreds uh, a year, you know, returns. Uh, personal, you know, and now our <laughs> many of our companies just like have all their employees, you know, file, we file all their employees returns too. It's like, you know, but um, yeah. So in terms of audit, it gets interesting because we can't audit our own books. Right. So our, we, we only audit um, and the audit arm is a, is a newer branch of our services, but it's, it, we only audit companies that we, um, you know, that we do not actively work with, right? We can't prepare the books and, and audit them. So there is that control there. So mo most of the time we're actually running the books. Um, I, so you, do, you do offer those services to yes. non-financial ops clients, if you will. Yes, okay. correct. Understood. And um, the, uh, you know, on the, you know, a lot of, so some of our clients are, uh, we have a, a BC PE fund in, in Massachusetts. Um, there's other cannabis funds throughout the country. Um, that are also our clients and kind of leverage us as you know they they probably they have a CFO but but they don't have you know we have you know we have sixty four employees so you know we we have a, a more firepower to be able to run these deals so whether it's uh, assessing a deal um, for an investment to see if it's if it's worthy from a financial perspective um, and, and bringing it up to the partners of the firm um, to actually running a deal and and you know, it, it is cannabis and, and there's a lot of uh, interesting transactions that go on, um, you know, a lot of handshake deals. Uh, so a lot of things in, in the due diligence process is just interesting what, what comes up and what we find. Um, and uh, oftentimes it works out well. Once in a while, you know, the, you know, deals have, you know, come apart just because they're, they're you know, what we've discovered um, you know, on, on either side kind of wasn't what it was expected to be. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a function that we often that, run. That's the purpose of due diligence. That's All right. So financial operations, due diligence, tax. You have some PE clients where they engage you to do due diligence for prospective investments. You don't do fund administration work for those, fund, right. for those funds, do you? Uh, no, but okay. what's interesting is um, on the... On the, uh, you know, it, it being acting as CFO and and sort of trusted partner for our clients, and, and I'm sure we're not unique in this. I think any uh, anyone who's doing good work for their clients, whether it's a lawyer, uh, even a publicist or a bank, even you know that the, you know the cannabis industry is very it's a small industry, and understanding the culture and the personalities uh, and in in that industry is is um, is very important to. To, to really servicing our clients well and understanding who our clients are. Uh, and, and we've been able to really build great relationships, amazing relationships um, throughout the country. And, and um, you know, being in that CFO role, it, it is such a sensitive position where our clients do come to us asking for help with funding, um, asking for help with, with, with connections, whether it's a tech resource or legal resource or um, you know, which POS system should we use? Um, and, and then, you know, so when it comes to, to, to that side of things, you know, that is where like a, a pro forma or a budget actually would, would be very important because, you know, we, we saw too often, and I'm sorry to go on to, you know, kind of on this rant, but we saw too often in, over the past few years, companies that didn't have their proper financial planning and, what ended up happening is they 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 need to raise when it's too late yeah. and and value and the valuations just go way down and and that breaks my heart because you could you know with the proper planning we could have we could have tripled your valuation but because yeah, we but they, just need the money in the door right now we're getting crazy interest rates or crazy you know, low valuations we 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 always advise because you know we're seed stage investors at our venture fund entrepreneurs to do a few things when they're figuring out how much to raise and when they're gonna be back in the capital markets. The first is to figure out when they're gonna run out of money. Back out nine months 
and figure out what that day is and then figure out what goals they have to establish by that date, nine months prior to running out. Because, you know, it takes time to get a deal done. And oftentimes they're maybe five months or six months, but they're never three months. Even insider rounds are never three months, even though they'll tell you it is, but it still takes time. Um, and then on that day, nine months prior to running out, what they need to look like what metrics need to be in place to pull either a extension round at flat or an up round that meets their goals and to plan that way. Because the last thing you want to do is sort of discover you're out of money in three and a half months. And now you got to, you know, look like a distressed property and go back to your existing investors and they're going to take a pound of flesh. So it's good. Uh, entrepreneurs should do that. And it's good that you help them figure that out. What, what would you say are, the challenges that early stage and seed stage companies have in just administering a financial operations internally. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, like, like you know, of course, one problem they have, which I've articulated is how to get the right kind of services for the amount of hours you need, right? But there must be other challenges at CSI. I just gave you another one, which is sort of planning about when they're gonna run out of money. Um, but what, what other challenges would you say that they have and just sort of thinking about it? Is it just lack yeah. of experience? You know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't, don't grow up through, through sort of public accounting or, you know, in-house financial ops. They come from marketing or product creation. So just trying to get the insight on what you see as some of the challenges that these yeah. kinds of companies have at the early stage. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, uh, what's not a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be easier to tell you what's not the challenge. Yeah. But, um, you know, um, I was just speaking to someone this morning. Uh, they they come from a big retail background. So they, they ran very large retail stores, made hundreds of millions of dollars in exits. And they like yeah they called us you know just literally from our from our website hey we want to um most people come from you know referrals but this is one of those cases that came from the just a call and hey we want to you know want to start this dispensary in this certain location so so it was interesting they said they said uh can you help us put in a pos system I said, no, so, so, and they're calling us, they want help with the business plan, with the financial model, um, you know, to, to make sure they have kind of the basics lined up. So then they said, can you help us uh, input a POS system at the store? I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely work with, you know, probably 10 POS systems that we like, you know, we can, we can talk about which one's pros and cons and choose one that's best for you. And then they said something I'd never heard before. They said, um, uh, said, what is the, if we have a POS system, why do we need you? <laughs> well, said, that, that <laughs> sounds like they really don't have sophistication. Yeah, I said, I said, it's very, I'm, I'm, I was a little confused with the question, but you know, again, I, I never want to assume anything and kind of want to, you, you have to t talk to the, you know, be with them at, at their level. If they're really not sure, then you have to be able to, to articulate. And I, I said, like, you know, first of all, and, and, and this kind of relates to, to your question, but in, in a roundabout way, but so I said, well, first of all, um, we need to, you know, you're going to have your POS system and people are going to pay in either debit or cash, uh, sometimes credit card, depending on who you are uh, or how risky you are, but, you know, debit card and, and, and cash is, is common. And uh, we want to make sure that the cash at the, at the, at the, at the, at the registers tied to the cash that's in, deposited into the safe, which ties to the cash that's deposited to the bank. We want to make sure those controls are so you can have the best POS system, but we need to make sure that we have those controls in place to make sure that ultimately you don't have someone at some point, you know, ripping off a thousand bucks here and there. Um, and 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 she, you know, I was surprised that she was kind of blown away. She's like, "Oh, you can do that? Like, how do you how do you possibly do that?" I <laughs> said, so, "Well, you know, I walked her through with her SOP, you know, and and it's so so." Going back to your question, you know, I, I'd say the the answer is oh, and then by the way, she also didn't know about two eighty e. 
so when I when I told her about it, like, wow, you're like applying for a license, and you know, it's, it's important to know some of the regulations and what you're going to be up against, so we can really help in minimizing those tax burdens. Anyway, going back to your question, what are the biggest challenges at the early early stage in seed companies? To me, it's really understanding what's needed on an operational perspective. You yeah. know, people think of accountants and finance as bean counting or you know even financial planning. That's correct. That is. And I'd say that's what most accountants do. And, and in most industries, you could probably get away with doing just that. But in cannabis, the integration of finance and operations especially is so crucial because you, know, it, it, you cannot work in a silo. And, and you know, in, in understanding operations and, and, and making sure that you have the right personnel to run the company, and, and have those checks and processes and SOPs in place so that you maintain metric compliance and tax compliance and you're actually profitable is, is really crucial. So I, from what I've seen, I would say really from the operational standpoint and having that integration of finance and operations and that planning, but actual execution on that and having the right team to be able to do that is, is the biggest challenge that I've seen from early stage companies. Yeah, totally get it. So when you engage with a customer, how do you start? Like what kind of assessment do you do? Kind of figure out what they need. Um, you know, certainly you're dealing with clients, certainly you have the tech and entertainment practice, you have the cannabis practice, even within cannabis, there are retailers only, there might be cultivators, there might be ancillary, they're all different, they're all at different stages. So what, how do you engage? Do you just sort of do an assessment? Do you just sort of look at what they're doing? Give us a sense for what that assessment onboarding process looks like. Yeah, no, and that's really important, and, and it's a good question. So th the first thing I like to do is, you know, it's kind of the first step is is understanding the business. You know, every, every, there could be a thousand dispensaries, and each one can operate slightly differently and, and have different goals, right? So it's, it's speaking to the CEO, to the COO, or the equivalent thereof, and it could be even the general manager and just really understanding what do you, what do you, what are you doing? Where do you guys see the challenges are um, high level? Cause when we drill down to the books in, in the first two weeks are really meant to, um, you know, on, on the, on the accounting side, we have our internal audit team that really just goes through and, and does this internal review from a 280 perspective, see the financial health of the company, do spot checks to make sure that, there's right, there's a proper support for the transactions. You know, we've we've gone through, you know, close to 150 audits at this point, whether it's CDDFA or um, or IRS. And um, you know, we try not to get it to the audit point. We kind of you know the, stop it in its tracks usually. Um, and but so well, we know what's needed, right? So we make sure that there's that audit readiness um, for, from a, an accounting perspective. But the, the, the first thing is really understanding the business and making sure that we, we understand what their challenges are and what their goals are so that we can meet those needs. So for example, we, someone might say, hey, we have, a, you know, we have this bookkeeper, you know, they've done a really good job of kind of putting all the data into the system correctly. We feel good about that. We, we, feel, we have a good sense of what we owe to whom but, but from a you know gap compliance, we don't we don't know what gap means, you know, or we don't know, you know. So it's really about just get, getting things on a cruel basis, getting you know, making sure that the that the 280e mitigation, you know, that's a con, you know, all over the board. So many companies, you know, they they have their own team or they have accounting firms that don't really understand cannabis and they're not booking things in that way. So we have to go back to create a whole schedule and. To, to really start allocating things in the right way to, to create those tax savings. Um, and, you know, so that's a kind of first 30 days is really focused on that. Next 30 days is actually implementing a lot of those inefficiencies that we've, that we've came across and wanted to improve upon. So we'll start putting SOPs around the pay to cash to, you know, payable cycle, AR to cash cycle, um, inventory and things like that. And then within 90 days is usually where we get to a very good steady state where each, you know, each person on the operation side kind of has, has a good sense of what they need to do. There's a good flow of information back and forth and we're able to really bang out the close uh, on a monthly basis and give it to the, to the uh, management team to be able to, to understand how they're 
companies running and making those decisions. How, how about client management? Is it, could it be anybody up and down the stack from controller to CFO that's the primary contact based on the maturity of the business? Or is there a layer that's sort of the interface for client management and interaction? Great question. So each client is, is unique. And each setup, each structure for each client, depending on their stage, if they're a startup, if they're early stage, if they're late stage, you know, the, the, it really, the structure is different. Um, but the principle is we want the most senior person on the account. Uh, in, in some cases, it's, it's a bookkeeper, right? Because it's a very, very early stage, but whoever it is, we want the point person to be the most senior person on the account, whether it's the senior controller or the CFO. So they're, um, they're all trained in addition to their discipline to sort of understand the nuances and dynamics of dealing with their clients, or is that something you have to continually train? Well, we have, we have, yeah, we, we do have, you know, ongoing training internally. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot, you know, of in, uh, internal training, right. The, what, and, and, you know, the, the, the main thing that I want to make sure that, that our employees know, um, is to be a rock for our clients. Because oftentimes our clients come to us not knowing the answer, not knowing which way to go, what is the best decision. So and, I need to and, empower and a our lot team. Of ang- and probably a lot of anxiety around yes. not knowing. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, a client came to me the other day, like, hey, I've been operating, I, I probably have like $45 million of revenue over the past three years and we haven't filed one tax return. <laughs> so it's like, and and I've got ten cents in the bank. <laughs> yeah, right. They have they have they have money. They have some money. Oh, that's good. But oh, yeah, that was good. But uh, yeah, it was like so. Again, it's like in, in empowering the team to be able to be to be leaders. And obviously, you know, our 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 approach is is not you know it's not our way or the highway. Um, we really work with our clients and understanding what they what they need, um, their pace. But we also do our best to guide them of you know to to what it should be and what it can be and and really work with the team to be able to do that. Understood. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Um, yeah. You know the mainstay of you know seed, early growth, and arguably growth companies is their operating model. Um, I've seen all kinds of extensible Excel operating models. Oftentimes, you know, I call them Excelware where you know, it's computing some future revenue and all of a sudden you see an EBITDA margin that's like 80% because you haven't sort of figured out your real staffing in the out years. I always sort of, you know, whenever I see a model, the only number I know is not going to happen in year four is the one that's actually on the spreadsheet. Any other numbers possible, but that one is not happening no matter what it is. But how important is an operating model uh, for this firm and, and what, you know, I'm, I'm gonna nerd out with this question to the extent that we can be sort of financial sort of operation. Let's get granular. Let's get some great, like, what are the best practices for designing those models? If you have a separate, this just shows I'm interested in this, a separate assumption sheet that sort of drives the model. Do you interface the assumption? What about dashboards? Like, wh- what's your best practice for providing that? And then my follow on question, I'll get it out would be, do you set it up such that the client can then drive the model? I like to drive the model, right? I like to have it created. I used to create them when I was younger. I'm much too old to do that now. Uh, not too proud, too old. But I like to drive the model once it's set up so I can scenario plan. I can play with headcount year three. I can play with operating margins. What is the best practices for setting those up? Yes, the having what I I call it operating model. I call it we call it budgets. We call it setting up a budget, like a, a good budget, and and that budget can be a pro forma used for investors, and it could also be just an operating budget for operating model um, for internal use. And we will will often create two different ones, um, just because forecasts will go out five years, and the operating budget is usually a year, <laughs> you know. Um, and then refreshes every quarter, you know, just to make sure that it's good. Um, in terms of structure, I, yes, we, we, we would have some sort of a, uh, you know, the top page is usually a dashboard that has 
revenue, COGS, gross profit, you know, maybe two, three lines of operating expenses, EBITDA, uh, net income, uh, taxes, net income uh, on the on the financial side. And then we'll have a chart that will either chart out the revenues, chart out profitability, and maybe a couple other metrics that are relevant for that specific vertical. Um, then when you get into it, we have an assumption page that does talk about, um, you know, we have some historicals in there, uh, some growth projections, and depending on what business unit it is, it'll have its custom made um, assumption sheet. So for example, a delivery company will have number of drivers and it'll be a function of sales and location and number of depots. So it really is, it, it gets a bit granular, but in general, my, my thesis and my philosophy on models is simpler, the better. So uh, get it as simple as possible while capturing the complexity of the business, right. not over putting tons of formula. Yes, everything is flows through. There's a PL balance sheet and cash flow, um, you know, but, but ultimately it's what are the key things that we really need to focus on? And then what are the things that are, you know, one-offs that we can kind of blanket in, a, in an other expense and miscellaneous, but what are the key drivers of revenue? What are the key drivers of costs and the COGS? And, and, and personnel, making sure that we have that really dialed in. Um, and uh, in terms of dashboard, I mean, I can show you actually um, one quick like dashboard, you know, that- Well, I mean, I, I don't know how much, well, sure, throw it up on the, throw it up on the screen just quickly, yeah. yeah so that's great, quickly. so you get, this is your KPIs, you get the ability to kind of see the health of your business on one screen, kind of look out, it's yeah. all integrated to changes you make through the assumption screen, that it's good stuff. That's a good yeah. one. I've seen a lot of them, but that's a great one. Um, one, just one more question before we probably bore to tears our listeners about going deep on models, but you also have in your assumption screen, um, the staffing plan so that you can turn off headcount in the out years. Do you have that sort of extrapolated sector? It'll, yeah, it'll be in the assumptions. Well, it will actually have each year will have its own row. So, um, you know, by position, it'll be zeros and ones, essentially, or, or twos, you know, if, if need be. Um, so, yeah, so you can always go to the outer years and, and adjust it on a year-by-year -year basis. All right. Thank you for nerding out with me. I, I love it, man. This is uh, I can, I can what we talk do. about models forever. Yeah. All right. So due diligence services uh, yeah. are part of what you do. It's important. Um, you know, I was the chairman of a company that acquired by a private equity firm 2014 outside of cannabis tech company. And we got the offer, we engaged counsel, and I checked in eight days in, and I looked at the accrued legal bill, and it was like 75K. I even wrote a blog post about this, and I was like, what? This is a week and a half. How could it be so much? And I learned that the reason it was so much is that there were so many things that were not documented, meeting minutes, employment agreements that weren't consistent, each one that had to be going through. So the post I wrote, and I'd like to kind of ask you your view of this, is about what companies can do early in their life to make due diligence smoother and quicker. Like how can they compare? Uh, uh, how can they prepare yeah. for, um, for this, because you know, ultimately, venture funded and many startups have the goal of exiting. They're not doing it to run a lifestyle business or a business that they're going to pass on to their heirs to create generational wealth. They're going to exit. So, with that in mind, what are some of the simple things that you could probably do early on to make that burden less and smoother? Not only does it increase cost, but it increases the timeline to get a deal done, and lots of things could happen with a long timeline. <laughs> Very true. Um, so th there's a, there's a, I think there's, you know, I, I really believe in the, you know, the, uh, what's it called? The, you know, minimum effect, you know, the minim minimum do dose, minimum dose. Um, the the li least you could do for the maximum effort, anyway. So, um, and there are very easy things to do early on, uh, even not that early on, you know, that, that can still be implemented somewhat easily. 
um, to, to prepare for that. And yes, I've also seen deals um, that, that I've been a part of, um, you know, I've, I've had the fortune of, of being part of quite a number of deals in, in the tech and entertainment space and, um, you know, bill, billions of dollars of deals uh, that, that, I was, that I was running um, in, in, you know, in pri prior to, to cannabis. And um, the, the thing that, I've, that I saw over and over is if you have a sleek data room <laughs> that is organized, that, it, that ties to your financials, that is, that, that is signed, the documents are signed, you know, and it's, it's, it, it just, it's not that much, you know, just a little bit a day. It's like just a matter of kind of taking everything that, that you have and organizing it. We've, I've actually seen an increase in one of my clients was able to get, because they had multiple bids, people weren't sure. We got a 20% increase in the valuation just by having an amazing data room that was super organized, clean, efficient. And it was able to, the guy who got through it faster, wanted the deal more and, and paid the extra buck. So, um, so we have a, we have a, you know, I'm sure it's, you could find online. We, we have developed our own, uh, you know, master folder structure and, and, and due diligence list that we've seen and from all the audits and due diligence that m &A that we've been a part of. Um, and, so, so kind of setting up all those things and getting all the things from legal and setting up this master folder structure every month, you know, we are saving all the invoices into a certain place. We're saving all the financials, all the accounting recs and packages. Everything is saved on a monthly basis. So actually the, the, what we call the perpetual data room is, is always ready because, you know, and this is, I should have probably said this earlier, but, you know, we'll, our goal is to always make sure that our clients are audit and investor ready, and and to do that, it's it's this data room is is the is, is the. I I hope our listeners appreciate the value of that advice. You know, a, a five percent increase in in you know an acquisition offer is enormous, yeah. and so I guess the way I would summarize that is just say create your filing system yeah. as though an investor is going to look at it. So every day when you sign an agreement, make sure it's in that, you know, have a folder structure, like I'm sure yours is great, where you know where it goes. And from day one, when you're storing a document, store it in that format in what would be essentially a private data room that at the right time would become a public data room. So you actually don't have to do any work. Maybe you'll do a little bit of massaging, but you don't have to do much work at the time yeah. that uh, you decide to go to the market to raise capital or you think about exiting. That's great advice. For um, any scrutiny that may come your way. <laughs> hey, if you would like to, I'd be honored to uh, co-write a blog post with you about that, send it out to our audience um, and yours about best practices and show that outline and give you- Absolutely, I'd be happy we should, to. We should talk about that. But um, anyway, that, that's great stuff. So we are um, coming close to the top of the hour. Yeah. I'd like to just maybe ask you if there's anything else that you'd like to cover I like to talk about. Um, oh, you know, before we do, let's just go back to that tax issue that we were talking about. That I should yeah. have taken. So, California, the difference between the illicit and the legal market is about a fifty percent differential, um, which is why the illegal market still, you know, three plus times uh, the legal market, the illicit to legal, still troubling. Um, there are efforts, I think, to get that under control. There've been some taxes waived, but it's a lot. What do you think? Again, this is, this is just sort of guesswork here. What do you think is the right differential? It's gotta be more, there's more value. It's a regulated industry. The, the product is tested. Is it 20%? Is that the point where you think consumers would, you know, without much thought, opt to buy legal product rather than illicit product? Is it 15%? Where, where do you think that range falls? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. I feel like we need to get our, our marketing, uh, <laughs> our marketing I know, look, that, that's a question more for an operator. So I get that. I just, it, it occurred no, to no. me as it's we were talking. Question, yeah, and, and um, 
you know, getting into the psychology of, you know, I, I always think about it more in the, what can the state do aside, you know, kind of to, to at least stop the black market, you know, and, and stop the bleeding. Um, what you're saying is, is something that I, I think I thought less about, which is how do we, you know, free, you know, they, I guess they say that, you know, in a dark, in a, in a, um, th there's two ways to deal with darkness, right? It's either kind of get rid of the, get rid of the, of the, or the two, two, two ways to deal with, with negativity, either push away the bad or bring a little light and that'll automatically kind of dissipate the darkness. You know, a little, little match in a dark room can bring a lot of light. So, um, you know, I was, I've always kind of thought about it in the negative way of like, okay, well, what can the state do to kind of, you know, you know, on, on obviously the state's nuts because they're, how much they're focusing on their own revenue. And, and it's, it's a, it's a, I actually wrote an article posted somewhere, Ben Zinger or something about this, like, um, that I, I was basically saying that like, it's a, it's a self-defeating prophecy because, uh, the state is forecasting all this revenue and based on this revenue, they're like, okay, great. This is going to be our taxes. But because the taxes are so high, the revenues don't hit what because it could have hit. Facilitating the illicit. Which, yep. is, which is what you're saying, right? Like what, what can the state exactly, do? What's that, what's that magic amount where it makes sense for the state? And because there's a burden, um, but that also doesn't sort of facilitate the continued legal market. Now, part of it is price. I think personally, it's about twenty percent. I, I, that sounds right. It sounds right. right Guess work. I've heard. I've heard that number bandied about. But you know what? Some people like sort of the the sport, if you will, or like the sort of the OG sort of mm -hmm. legacy feeling of still buying from Eddie at the corner yeah. um, than they do going into you know, you know, one of the nicer stores. So, uh, but I think to eliminate the price objection part. I feel like that's about the right number and you're not going to get everybody. I think you're right. Yeah. You know, and, th there and is there's, a romant there's, there's a romanticization about legacy strains that you're maybe not going to get, particularly in California, um, buying through legal channels. So there's, there's that at play. But I, I, I feel like that's the right number. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. I think that is the right number. And... Um... Yeah, listen, it's a, the industry is, you know, coming in from the, at the beginning, you know, years ago, I, I was very shocked, you know, to, at, at, at the inner workings of cannabis and the personalities and the people and understanding the culture. And, you know, it, it, it was, now there's already larger people getting in and it's kind of the, the, the feel of what it used to be is, is not the same. But um, but I think there still is a, a large, the community, the cannabis community, I think is still extremely important. And it's something that I, you know, took me a lot of time to, to really understand and, and, uh, and then be a part of um, and, and understanding that it's, it's ethos first and, and business second in, in many ways in, in cannabis, you know, that there kind of needs to be a focus on the relationship and a focus on on what we're what the industry is doing in, in, in general really taking this thing which has been so taboo and bringing it to, to you know as, as an accepted and form of enjoyment of medicine you know it really is medicine for so many people and i've, I've had I've stories in my family um of, of of how this has saved lives and um and it's something that i that I'm, I'm passionate about. And, and, you know, you mentioned psychedelics, um, you know, my, my last two cents on, on that is I I'm right there. You know, one of our clients is maps and, um, you know, great we, organization. Yeah. They're, they're amazing. And, and, uh, you know, just the CFO just of maps just called me while we're on this call. I have to, <laughs> to tell them I'll call them back after, but the, the, you know, it's, there really is a revolution that's going on in, in people's minds and, and slowly, you know, taking effect in, 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 in the law. And I, I do hope that we'll be able to continue to help these industries and these medicines get into the right hands in the right way uh, and help people do it compliantly and, and help these businesses that are ultimately small businesses 
be able to uh, to succeed in in, in um, given all the challenges that they have. Well, look, I'm just thankful that as this industry has evolved, that it's been able to attract professionals like you with your skill set that can come and lend their good service to the industry. So I thank you for that. Um, and I do thank you for a great, rich and engaging conversation today. Um, again, we, we're about, you know, we're thrilled to have you as an alliance partner. Um, and uh, thank you again for this, this great interview. All Absolutely. right, with that. Yeah, great. So look, with that, let, let me wrap up. Thank you, Lorenzo, uh, for joining today. To learn more about North Star, what is your website link? It's nstarfinance.com. nstarfinance.com. Okay, so to get to Lorenzo, visit their website. Um, is that the best way to contact you or is there? Absolutely. A Okay, awesome. And then, of course, to learn more about the ArcView Group, visit our website, arcviewgroup.com. From that landing page, you can access our capital group, our venture group, our consulting group, and our ArcView events and experience group. Um, so that's the best way to get a hold of us. And again, thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope that you enjoyed today's program. Enjoy your weekend.